Well, turn in your Bibles tonight, if you will, please, to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. All this month, I am speaking to us about the Bible, the Word of God. And tonight, I want to be able to challenge us once again uh, about the importance of of the Scriptures. This morning, I talked to us out of the 17th chapter of Acts about the Church of Berea, and that is the theme tonight. We'll be going, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> let's use our Bibles just a little bit. Uh, it may scare the Bible, but uh, look in Acts chapter number 17 and hold your place in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. In Acts 17, verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, hold on to that. We're going to come back and visit that again tonight in a different respect. Then, in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that belief. Verse 11, excuse me, verse number 12 uh, very important that we understand that our responsibility after the Word of God is preached, and I want you to hold on to this, I'm going to build on this tonight, this is very important, is that we receive the Word of God. Now, I want to tell you what I think about this. I may be mistaken. I don't think I am. If I am, it'll be like I heard Jerry Falwell years ago on the old-fashioned gospel hour. They uh getting ready for uh, to have their program, and he came up to the pulpit. And he said, we have just received a bomb threat. Uh, somebody has just called in a bomb threat that they're going to blow the building up during the service. Now, he said, we've checked and we can't find one. So we're going to go ahead with the service because he said, I don't think there's a bomb here. But he said, if there is, I'll meet you at the judgment seat. Now, what I'm going to say tonight is, is, is a truth that I believe, and I believe it very firmly. As you know, I am a local church man. I believe anything that God's going to do, He does it through the church. I'm a church man, and I believe, and I think the Bible can confirm this and verify this, that when the man of God stands and preaches the Word of God to the people of God, that we shall answer at the judgment seat for how we pay attention to and listen to the Word of God. And I believe that. Now, I will take it a second step farther, because this is serious stuff. I believe we'll answer for it even if we don't show up, because when your wife sets the table... You better show up. When she does all of the work that she does, and you say, I'm sorry, I'm not coming home for lunch, then uh, that's when the doghouse becomes a reality. And when God says that we're supposed to be identified with that local assembly, the Bible's very clear on that. And then God sends a pastor to that local assembly to feed that assembly then I believe that God will hold us accountable for what's preached in that pulpit. Now, wait a minute. That makes it serious business. Serious business on my part and serious business on your part. So we both, by the way, while we're here, turn to the book of Hebrews. I think I can help you with that. A verse of Scripture just comes to my mind. Uh, Chapter 13, book of Hebrews. I, I think it's right here. I, 
Look, look at Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 17. Uh, the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. Now, I want to say to you very, very uh, straightforward that the heaviest burden that this pastor carries for the people he pastors is what this verse of Scripture just established. There's never a day, I don't think, in my life that goes by, but what I think about the salvation of the people that I minister to. My heart's desire, my all-consuming desire, <clears throat> is that the people that I minister to know that they know they're saved. I am here to watch for your soul. I'm like a watchman on the wall. Any good pastor is doing what this verse of Scripture says. They watch for your soul. Uh, John said, he, he said, I have no greater joy than, than to hear about your growth, your growth in the faith is what he was saying. I have no greater joy when people come to me and they say, man, I'll tell you, my life's growing. I love the Lord more now than I did last year. That's the way it ought to be. Not only do we watch for your soul that you might be saved, but we watch that you may prosper after you're saved. Now, verse 17, Obey them the rule of you, for, you, for they watch for your souls. Now watch this. As they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Now, you say, what does that mean? One day, I'm going to have to stand in the presence of the Lord and give an account to God for what I do right here in this pulpit. Now, I want to tell you something. There may be a lot of people that play around with that, but I don't. I take that seriously. I don't want God to have to say to me, Pastor Beatty, why did you not preach the truth to that group of people? Why did you not warn them? Why did you not instruct them? Why did you not tell them? Why did you cut this corner and that corner? I don't want the Lord to have to say that. And as far as I know, people here love me, and I love them. But I want you to understand something. I'm more concerned about what my Lord thinks about me than I am what you think about me. Now, I know you love me, and I love you, and we love each other, and thank God for that. But I want you to know, I don't take this lightly. I have a responsibility to God for, watch, for watching over your soul. And the Bible says that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Now, this fourth church I pastored, this will probably be the one... I go to heaven from, Lord willing. But uh, I can say this, that I have more joy pastoring this church than any church I've ever pastored in my life. Uh, you are my joy and my crown. I love you very much. And I'm very honored that I have the privilege to stand here. But I want you to notice this last phrase. The Bible says that we have the responsibility of paying attention to what we are taught and what is preached to us. And that if we don't, last phrase of verse 17, for that is unprofitable for you. What's he talking about? Meet it again at the judgment seat. That's what I was talking about just a moment ago. We're going to meet it again. I'm going to meet it, and you're going to meet it, and I'm concerned about the kind of food that we serve. Now, uh, turn, to book, turn to the book of Acts chapter 13. And let me just give you a scripture or two here in anticipation of the message tonight. Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 46. Notice what the Bible says. Now let's back up to verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city to, together. And notice what they come together for. To hear the Word of God. That's what this month's about. That's the theme this month. Hearing the Word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, that they were filled with envy, and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Now, thank God we don't have to go through something like that. Thank God we don't have somebody stand up in the service and say, Hey, I don't appreciate that. Don't think you ought to be preaching that. Thank God that we come in here to worship and learn more about the Bible and God's claims on our lives. Here, they are, the Gentiles are coming together, some of the Jews are coming together, in order that they might hear the Word of God, and there is a mixed multitude of people that could care less about what the Bible says. Therefore, verse 46, now here's the verse I want you to notice. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the Word of God should first have been spoken to you. In other words, the Word of God went first to the Jew. 
uh, Jesus came unto his own, the Jew. He came to establish his kingdom in the economy of God. Of course, God knew that the, his son would be rejected. He would, be, uh, he would wear a crown of thorns instead of wearing a royal diadem. And, uh, and as a result, God knew that his son would be crucified. But even on the other side of Calvary and the resurrection, the Word of God is offered again to the Jews. And what do they do? When they, when they hear the Word of God, they have a responsibility to either receive it. You remember this morning I said there's two words for receive. One word is to get it into our mind. The second word is to get it in our heart to produce action in our lives. Well, the Jews have the opportunity to do that. But what did they do? They heard the Word of God, but they didn't do anything about it. Now, that's true in every service. We have the responsibility when we come to the house of God. We can hear the Word and just idly forget about the Word, or we can allow the Word of God to transform us, to change us, and to challenge us to do the work that God has called us to do. Now, they preached to the Jews in verse number 46, it was necessary that the Word of God should have been spoken to you. Now, watch this. Here is what happens in every service. But seeing, you put it from you. In other words, you have the responsibility to hear the Word. But he said, you... Heard it with your head, with your mind. You heard it physically, but you did not do anything with it. Now, watch this. As a result of that, seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, get a hold of that. They had the responsibility to receive it. They heard it, but they did nothing about it. My question to us tonight is, what do we do with it? I'm going to talk a lot about that. And we ought to embrace the Word of God as we come to the house of God. Now, we're to receive the Word of God into our hearts, that it may germinate on good ground. You remember the story that our Savior told about the Word of God falling on the different grounds? You remember he said that the soil went forth to sow, and the seed, which represents the Word of God, said some of it fell by the wayside, and said some of it fell among thorns, some of it fell on stony places, and some of it fell on good ground. Where does the Word of God tonight lie in the confines of our life when we hear it? It ought to fall on good, productive ground. You see... <clears throat> Look, look with me in 1 Thessalonians, again, chapter 2, verse number 13. When we receive the Word of God, he said, which you've heard of us, you received it. Now watch this. Not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. We need to receive the Word of God into our hearts. Watch this very closely. Not as man's Word. Because the truth is, when it comes to God's Word, if we really want to be all that God would have us to be, we don't have an option. We receive it as the Word of God. Now look at back in the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, verse number 6. Notice what the Bible says. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Why? Look at the rest of the phrase. Having received the Word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now, man, I can just preach for next hour on that verse. Notice, if you will, please, you remember the story in the uh, 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Paul went to Thessalonica for three Sabbath days, and they got upset. The Bible said the baser sort of people, they come against them, and they had to leave the city, and they went over to Berea. And there was much persecution in the city of Thessalonica. Now, that's what he's referring to in, here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 6. He said, you became followers of us, and you became followers of the Lord. Because, he said, when the affliction came, you received the Word of God, and you did not allow the affliction to prevent you, to keep you from that which had the ability of establishing you in the faith, and that was the Word of God. And notice what happened here when they received that. The Word of God in the affliction, in the persecution, in the tribulation, they had it with joy and the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because it is the Word of God that establishes you 
in troubled, difficult times. Hold on a minute. Get a hold of this. I happen to know there's people in this building tonight going through some very difficult times. And I'm going to tell you, folks, the key is in this verse in the first chapter right here. I see Brother Bo over here. His wife's sick a lot. Bo's sick a lot. Got a lot of back trouble. And back there's Brother Gerald sitting back here in the back of the church. He's sick a lot and a lot of back trouble. And a lot of you other people in here tonight. <clears throat> but they're in the house of God tonight. And let me tell you what, when people get discouraged... When, when problems come and these old bodies begin to disintegrate and fall apart and troubles come into your life, what is it that keeps you on track? What is it that keeps you focused? What is it that keeps you moving in the right direction and you don't throw in the towel and raise the flag of surrender? And what is it that keeps you moving on down the journey of life? I'll tell you what will do it. It's this blessed old book, the blessed Word of God. This Bible can keep you focused. And when you don't stay in this book, you get unfocused. You get a fuzzy picture. They, in their time of difficulty, had joy. Isn't that amazing? Why, it doesn't take more than an ingrown toenail to stop some people. A little bit of rain on Sunday morning, a short circuit to average Baptist. But the truth is, these people were undergoing great persecution, and they stayed focused because they received the Word of God in much affliction, but the affliction did not stop the joy they got out of the Word of God as the Holy Spirit made the application in your life. Let me tell you, the Word of God will strengthen you. The Word of God will encourage you. You get down and out, you just get this, this blessed old book, and you start reading about the promises of God, and the next thing you know, you're up and going, because this Bible reminds you, bless God, I'm not home, and I'm not going to have to live like this always, and I'm not going to always go through this, and I just got a hold of some juices, and I got a hold of some good old spiritual steak here in the Word of God, and bless God, my hope's not in this world, and my hope's not in the things of this world, and, and uh, I'm not going to be here long anyway, and God's going to be with me while I am here, and I've got heaven when it's going to be over and all of eternity with my Savior. I'm going to the homecoming in the sky. I'm telling you, if you get in this book and start reading about reality, you can be encouraged in difficult times. Now, that's what it's all about. Now, what is it? What is it that we've got to have? Well, we're to, we've got to receive. Here it is. First Thessalonians chapter number 2. Again, verse 13. They read the Word of God. You heard it of us. You received it. Not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. Now, uh, how long do you think people would come to this church? If I stood up here next Sunday morning and I said, Okay, folks, we're going to change the menu for the next six weeks. Here's what we're going to do. For the next six weeks, I'm going to lecture on Shakespeare. I'm going to talk about old Romeo. I'm going to talk about sweet Juliet. And for the next six weeks, we're just going to kind of leave the Bible aside, and we're going to lecture on Shakespeare. No, no, it wouldn't last. What is it that keeps people coming back? It's that book you've got in front of you tonight. It's that blessed old book that you read. It's that blessed old book you carry under your arm. And you know what I have found about this blessed old book? You can't exhaust the contents of this book. I've been preaching this book for 27 years in this church, and people still keep coming to hear the Word of God. You know why? Because when you read this book, you read it as the Word of God. And when you hear this book, you hear this book as the Word of God. And you say, wait a minute, God's got something to say to me, and God's speaking to me from this book. So I think I'll go down to the house of God to see what God says to the pastor so the pastor can help me down the journey of life. And you keep coming back to see what God's got to say through His book. You recognize that what the pastor's saying is not out of a man-made book, some man-made dogma. But here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verse number 13, when they received it, they did not receive it as the Word of men, but they received it as the Word of God. And that's the thing that excites me tonight. This is God's Word to the church. This blessed old book, written with over 40 authors, with all kinds of different occupations, uh, old... Uh, Old Muhammad, he had these visions, and he's the sole author of a bunch of garbage that Saddam Hussein carried to his hand to the gallows and found out when that rope choked him to death 
and broke his neck. He found out that what he'd been holding on to all of those years uh, was not worth the flip, wasn't worth the time it took him to look into it, because there's only one God, and it's certainly not the God of Islam, and yet that's the fastest growing movement in the world, and the devil's having a heyday sending people to hell in confusion and in error and in heresy. But there is a book, it's not the words of men, it's the Word of God. And the Bible's very clear that this Bible came to us from the very breath of God Himself. And He breathed upon humanity, and He controlled the thoughts of humanity, and He controlled the words of humanity. And what man wrote down was what man received as the very oracles of God Himself. And that's the reason tonight we keep coming to church, is because we know we've got a book here that's not... The Word of men, but like the church of Thessalonica, we've got God's very words in front of us tonight. That's the reason it's serious business. It's important that we receive it as such, the Word of God to our hearts. I think about those people where they wrote from. There were kings that helped write this Bible. Old David. Oh, that sweet singer of Israel. I imagine back on the backside, looking after those sheep and tending sheep. That little old red-headed Rudy boy, alone with God, fellowshipping with God, out there on the backside of the desert, the one who recognized the presence of God upon his life when the bear and the lion had come, and he said, I got a hold of those two animals, and made a translation, he said, I turned them wrong side out, and because God gave me victory over the bear and over the lion, he's going to give me victory over this old uncircumcised Philistine. And thank God he did. He picked up a stone, and the Holy Ghost took the stone and implanted it in the forehead of that giant. And old David knew that God had done that, and that he was a vessel through which God used. And back there on the backside of the desert, walking with God, and God gave him inspiration, and much of the Psalms was the Psalms of the sweet singer of Israel, but it's not what the sweet singer of Israel composed, it's what God gave him as the king of Israel. Not only did he use kings to write the Bible, but he used old common fishermen. By the way, he used old fishermen that at one time were cursing and vile and wasn't even sanctified good after they got saved. But God used them to write the book. Think about that. He said, well, I don't know if I want to read Peter's writings or not. Peter was only the human instrument through whom God used, spoke to bring His words to us. And you read the book of First and Second Peter, you're reading about a man, you think about this. At one time, he was an old vile fisherman out on the Lake of Galilee, probably cursing every time something go wrong. Old hot-headed Peter was cursing and swearing and probably fighting and no telling what all he was into and uh, even denying the Lord after he met the Master. But one day on the other side of the resurrection, he realized he had plugged into something that was bigger than he was and something that had more power than he had. Uh, and as a result of the resurrection, he got his life completely transformed. Uh, and he wrote the book of First and Second Peter. And he said over in the book of Peter, and I thought so much about this, he said, the reason sometimes people get cold and indifferent is because they 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 forget they they forget where they come from and they forget the price that was used to redeem their never dying soul. And he wrote to them and he said, well, after I'm gone, after my exodus, after I'm in the presence of the Lord, I'm writing these things unto you that you may know how you ought to live when I'm dead and gone. And he said, I want you to grow and get a hold of the Bible and love the Word of God. God used the old fishermen to tell us how God loved us. Hallelujah, he sure did. He used those sorry tax collectors. You think about it. An old man named Matthew, one day sitting at the receipt of custom, and Jesus passed by and said, follow me. And nobody was hated more in those days than tax collectors, and probably today too. The Rome would say to those tax collectors, you enact so much taxes for Rome, and then you go ahead and beyond that, you place on there however, whatever percentage you choose to place on there for your own benefit. And they robbed the people blind. They robbed them blind. One day Jesus passed by, and there was that old tax collector hated and despised, but he met the Master one day. And when you read the first book of the New Testament, you're reading the book of a former tax collector. You're reading the book of a man whose life was changed, and he wrote about Jesus from the kingly point of view. 
And he talked about the, the eternal Son of God, but the Holy Spirit of God enabled him to do so, to help us have a portion of God's Word. Now think about it. The Bible came to us from kings. The Bible came to us from fishermen. The Bible came to, <laughs> came to us from former tax collectors. Think about that. The Bible came to us from shepherds. There was another. Have you ever noticed in the Bible how often God used shepherds? There's another man that wrote the Pentateuch. His name was Mo. He was a shepherd. Why, he was tending his father-in-law's sheep when the bush caught on fire, and it wasn't George Bush. He caught the bush was on fire, and God spoke to him out of the bush, and and God used him in a in a mighty way. God used prophets. Isaiah, case in point. God greatly used him and Ezekiel and, and Micah and, uh, and uh, Daniel and all of these great men. He used physicians. Dr. Luke traveled. Well, Paul gave us two wonderful books in the New Testament, gave us the gospel according to Luke. And, of course, God used him to pen the book of Acts. And, and it's, so, it's so amazing that God used people well-known and He used people unknown. He used rich people and He used poor people. Why, he used educated Moses, uh, educated in the king's palace back in the Old Testament. But he used an uneducated Peter in the New Testament to get the gospel to us. Isn't that amazing? He used over 40 different authors. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation, last chapter, last verse, he used over 40 different authors uh, to remind us in these 66 books that this is the Word of God. Well, the Word of God came to us from so many different parts of the country. It came to us from Asia. It came to us from Africa. The Word of God came to us from Europe. Paul wrote the Word of God to us from a dungeon over in Rome. James wrote the Word of God to us from Jerusalem. Moses wrote the Word of God to us from Sinai. Daniel wrote the Word of God to us from Babylon. And over a 1,500-year period, these people from all walks of life, Many of these people had never met the other authors of this book. They had never talked to them. And yet all of these people uh, writing all of these different books of the Bible, listen to me, here's the key. They wrote all of these books of the Bible under one theme and one topic, and that topic is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. What if we tonight decided that we wanted to compose a book on a particular subject, and we go across Winston-Salem, and we give everybody a particular subject to write on, and uh, we say, you bring the subject back at a certain time. I can tell you there would not be complete unity. There would be a lot of disunity in their different points of view. But here, here are 66 books written over 1,500-year period of time. And they all write in unison and in agreement. What a book. Man, what a powerful book. And I want to say again that this is a book about Jesus. Now let me prove it to you. I'm so glad you asked me to. Turn in your Bibles for just a moment to the book of John, the Gospel of John. And uh, let's, let's notice what Jesus said in the fifth chapter of John. I love this. I love this. John chapter number 5. That's the reason I love this book, because this is my Savior's words. <laughs> hey, this is the one died for us that gave us this book. Yeah, and it's all about Him. Thank God. It's all about Jesus. You say, how do you know it, preacher? Here it is. John chapter 5, verse number 39. Jesus said, search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Wait a minute. He didn't have the New Testament. He didn't have the New Testament. Now, he was the Word. But Jesus said, you search the Scriptures. Because in all of these Scriptures, talking about Old Testament, these Scriptures in the Old Testament, he said, they are testifying about me. Hey, let me say it again, folks. That book you've got in front of you tonight is a book to introduce you to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen. Don't get beyond that. Don't you miss that. Now, Jesus said something is powerful here. He said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. What's he saying? 
The religious leaders of his day believed that their very exposure to the writings of Moses and the Old Testament prophets meant that they was right with God, and they was clinging to the book, but not clinging to the Savior. Now, I'm saying we need the book. Listen closely. The book is an arrow. The book is a compass that's always pointing to Jesus. Now, wait a minute. Don't you miss it? We've got to have the book. But just holding the book in your hand won't save you. You've got to get to the person this book's pointing to. <laughs> and this book's pointing to my Savior tonight. Jesus said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think they have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me. We get together tonight and we plan a trip. And, and we've done this with our young people a few years ago. And we, we take our young people, let's just say, and we take you. And uh, we get buses and, and we go up to Chicago. And we get on an elevator. And I think it takes two or three different elevators. And we go all of the way to the top of the Sears Tower. At one time, the largest, tallest building in the world. It's no longer that way. I think there's about five or six now that's taller than the Sears Tower. But the Sears Tower is as tall as I want to get. So we get up on the top floor on the observation deck of the Sears Tower. Man, you can see forever. I mean, we've been down where our daughter uh, uh, visited our daughter and a long ways from Chicago you can see that huge Sears Tower sticking up in the skyline of Chicago. And you go up there on that observation deck and that huge Sears Tower, and you can look out across that huge city of Chicago, and you can look over to Lake Shore Drive and all of the lakes out there on the shores of Chicago, and you're standing up there in amazement, and you say, man, this is really something. Look at the traffic down there. It looks like little old bug cars going up and down the streets. Uh, and you can almost look down at the airplanes as they go by, and you say, man, what a view this is. Look at this place. Look how large it is. And you're standing up there, and you're enjoying the view. And you look out over the lakes, and you're enjoying the view. And suddenly somebody begins to shove against you, and they begin to tap you on the shoulder, and they say to you, get out of the way. I've got something to do. And they push by you, and they pull a pocket knife out. And they say, this, this glass here that you're looking through, I'm going to get, I've got to get a little piece of this glass here, and I've got to analyze this glass, and I've got to see what this glass is made out of. I, I'm just, I'm really, I am really overtaken. I am really beyond myself. I'm be, really beyond my ability to comprehend at this beautiful glass. And they make a big deal over that glass, uh, and they can't see the city, and they can't see the Lakeshore Drive, and they can't see the waters off of the city of Chicago. Uh, uh, let me tell you something. They've missed the whole purpose of the glass up there that people are looking through. The glass up there is to keep some idiot from jumping off, but more than that uh, is to keep some of the wind down. But they are looking through the glass. The glass is not the spectacle. It's what you look through the glass to see. That is the spectacle. And the Bible is a wonderful, wonderful book. It is God's Word, but it is a vehicle that we look through to see a person. And the person that we're looking through the Bible to see is Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to stand up and defend the Bible because it is God's Word. But this Bible is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. The Bible laying on your coffee table or on your end table is not going to help your spiritual growth one hour. Some of your neighbors comes over and they say, do you remember Aunt Karen? Oh, yeah, I remember her. She died 15 years ago. Well, you know, I didn't know if she was living or not. I didn't know if she was still alive, and if she was, I didn't know where she lived. And I was just wondering if she was alive, how she was getting along. And, oh, no, she's dead. I, well, I'm sorry, I didn't even see that in the newspaper. I, I would have thought I would have seen that new obituary. Oh, I've got it. And they go do something that hadn't been done in 10 years. They find the family Bible. And for the first time in ten years, they opened the Bible up to get a dumb obituary column out. So they can find out about Aunt Karen that lived 15 years ago and find out when she died and where she was buried and all of the details concerning her funeral. I've actually been in people's house, Bo, when they would open up their Bible. And guess what was laying in the center of that book? A four-leaf clover. 
I've seen that. They put a four-leaf clover in there, and they say, this Bible will press that four-leaf clover, and I'm going to have, I'm going to have good luck because I've got a four-leaf clover in the Word of God. Let me tell you, if the Word of God can't help you, the four-leaf clover can't. I remember when I was a boy, they used to, they used to advertise rabbit's feet. Good luck charm. I remember one time I sold something and I bought me a rabbit's foot. They said, you get this rabbit's foot and it's got a little old chain on it and you can put it on your belt, put it in your pocket, and it'll give you good luck. And all of a sudden one day I was out carrying that thing around and all of a sudden it dawned on me it sure wasn't good luck for the rabbit. If it, can't, if it couldn't help the rabbit, I don't know how in the world it could help me. I hear people say, well, you know, we've got our, we've got all of our family members uh, registered over here in this Bible. We've got all the people that's died in their family. We've got all the obituary columns over. We've got it written down over there in the family section. All of that's okay so far as it goes. But the Bible is not going to help you spiritually one iota when it becomes a depository of family relics. The Word of God is given to us that we may grow and love Jesus more every day of our life. Absolutely. There's unity in this book. This book's timeless. It's still up to date. And you can't exhaust it. Charles Spurgeon said, if I had all of eternity to preach the Bible, I could never exhaust its contents. I've got some commentaries in my office I've exhausted. I was reading the other day, I like this. I was reading the other day, a preacher of yesteryears, one of the old Puritan preachers. He was sitting in his study one day, and he looked at his thousands of volumes over on his bookshelf. And he said to himself, books, he said, you have been a vial of water to me to, to help my thirsty soul in the times of need. He said, books, you've kind of been a balm of Gilead to me. He said, I have drank from your resources. Many times when I was preparing a message, I have drank from your resources. Many times when I needed help, better understanding, I have drank from your resources. And then he looked at his Bible and he said, oh, but hallelujah. He said, the Bible is better than those books I drank from. Because he said, the Bible is the very spring itself from which the water comes. And the Bible is the source from which all those commentaries got their truth. And that so, thank God for volumes of books and for preachers. And I've got thousands of books and tapes. And, and I've tried to study and apply myself all of those years. Uh, but they're only there because this book is in front of us tonight. This book is the source. This is the spring. This is the fountainhead of everything else we possess this evening. This is God's Word. It's God's Word. Now, how are we to receive it? I want you to turn with me to James. I'm getting ready to go somewhere. This is powerful, and I hope you'll turn with me to the book of James. How do we receive the Word of God as it's preached, as we read it, as we study it? What does the Bible say about the way we receive the Word of God? Turn, please, to the book of James, chapter number 1. I want you to notice with me verse number 21. James, chapter 1, verse number 21. Notice what the Bible says. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness, the engrafted Word which is able to save your soul. That superfluity of knowledge is, is a very interesting phrase. It's the picture of a garden that's full of weeds. A picture of a garden that's full of weeds. If you're going to have a good garden, you've got to get the weeds out. If you're going to have a good walk with God, you've got to get rid of the weeds. When I was young, my parents... My parents raised tobacco. I know that's the cardinal sin today. But my parents raised tobacco, and we raised corn. It was on a dairy farm. I wouldn't do it today if I had the opportunity to do so, of course. But one year, they leased out our crop to a neighbor. I shall never forget the neighbor just let it go. 
and the grass overtook the crop. And when the grass overtook the, the crop, here's what it done. The nutrients that were supposed to go into the crop went into the grass, and the crop began to turn yellow and dry up because the nutrients that the crop needed was going into that which did not belong. A lot of Christians live in there. A lot of Christians live in there. God's got some nutrients from you. But you're going to have to get away from that which saps your vital energy, and you're going to have to get to that, lay aside that superfluity of naughtiness, and you're going to have to get out of the garden that's filled with weeds and get to the Word of God, because you're not, listen to me, you're not going to get anything that you're going to read that's going to help you like this Bible. Thank God for good commentaries. I've got many. I love to read them, and I'm all, always looking for good books. I probably end up, I'll buy a book or two or three or four, sometimes eight or ten a month. Thank God for good books. But there's nothing that will give you the refreshment that this Bible will give you. And he said, lay aside some things. Get to the Word of God. Get back to the Word of God. I, 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 I recently subscribed. I get, I get some papers that try to help me stay abreast of what's going on in our country. I just recently subscribed to a newspaper coming out of Washington, D.C. It's called uh, Human Events. It's a very conservative paper. It keeps you right up front on what's going on on the conservative side of the political spectrum of this country. And I've got it. And uh, I got one yesterday. I kind of looked through it like a cow eating grass. I kind of grazed through it. But I didn't find anything in there that caused me to just get bogged down. But when I pick up this Bible, there is just something about this Bible, like a magnet, that just draws me to this book. And thank God when I get to this Bible, I find some truths there that the sports section won't give me. I find some truths there that the front page of the newspaper won't give me. Because I'm finding more and more the front page of the newspaper is reading more and more like my Bible's reading. So I'll just go to the Bible and get the book. It's more up to date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. So I'll just stay by the book. Now, he said when we approach the Word, we're to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And I want you to notice what he says here. Now, this is vitally important. And if you haven't heard what I've said, please wake up and hear this. And superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. Now, I want you to look at this word meekness. Here's the key. How are we to receive God's Word? He said, receive it with meekness. Now, listen to me, folks. I want you to get what I'm about to tell you. What he's saying is that we're to receive the Word of God with meekness. And that means that we are to receive the Word of God with a teachable spirit. Now, now, follow me closely. My question to us tonight is, are we willing to be taught by the Word? Oh, you say, preacher, I sure am. You tell me what it says, I'm going to do it. Well, let me preach for the next hour on tithing. Well, preacher, you're meddling now. You're no longer preaching. Preacher, talk to me about this. Wait a minute. We are to receive the Word with meekness, with a humble, teachable spirit. And my question to us tonight is, are you willing, are we willing to take the Bible as it is to us as we are in order that we might become what the Bible is trying to teach us to become, are we teachable enough that we can receive the Word of God, listen, without being offended? Receive the Word of God with meekness, with a teachable spirit. Now, preacher, be careful. You may offend me. Now, preacher, you better be careful what you say. You might make someone mad. John Wesley said it one time. He said when he first started preaching, he was afraid he was going to make somebody mad. He said before he, before he went to heaven on down the latter years of his ministry, he said, now I'm afraid when I preach, I won't make somebody mad. I, now, I don't get up here and intentionally try to make anybody mad. I've got enough enemies just preaching the truth. 
But uh, notice with me, please. You've got your hold your place and turn right back to the previous book, the book of Hebrews, chapter four. The book of Hebrews, chapter four, and notice verse number one. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now here's a group of people, he said they heard the word and it profited them. But there was another group that heard the word and it did not profit them because they would not accept the word by faith. Are you willing to be taught? You say, preacher, I know it all. You need to be taught. You say, preacher, I want to impress you, impress you with what I know. No, no, no. You need to be taught. I need to be taught. We need to be taught from the Word of God. Look. I don't have, God bears me witness, I don't have a personal vendetta against anybody that I pastor. Nobody knows but God how much I love the people that I preach to. I hear people say, you know, you're, you're tough, you're hard. No, 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 wait a minute. Anytime you preach this Bible, you're going to be accused of that. Because the Bible that I preach doesn't cut any corners. It hits us straight. It hits us where we're at. But I'll tell you something. I do not have a personal vendetta against anybody that I preach to. However, I don't check with anybody before I preach. And I don't have a committee that looks over my sermons before I come out here. Well, I do. There's three of them. It's called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when I come out here, it is my responsibility to preach to you the truth. And it is your responsibility to receive it with meekness, with a teachable spirit, and not be easily offended because the preacher may say something that you don't necessarily agree with. Hey, Amen, preacher. Good preaching there, brother. Are we teachable? Most of you are, and I'm very grateful for that. May we be like Samuel in the Old Testament. May we be like him. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Well, I want to tell you something, folks. I'm not preaching to you something tonight that I'm not trying to practice. When I was in my home church, I wanted to receive that engrafted Word of God into my life that I might be and become all that God wanted me to be and become. I've had preachers that grill me. I'm not talking about medium well. I'm talking about well done. I've, I used to sit in my home church. I used to sit on this side. I'd sit on the front. And I'd see old brother Joe Surratt, and brother E.M. James, brother Eugene Goodman. I can just, in my mind right now, especially, and there's, just, there's two of those guys that really stand out in my mind, and that's Brother Joe Surratt and uh, Brother, Brother Eugene Goodman. I can see those preachers in my mind right now standing up preaching the Word of God and tearing me up. And I'm just like that old saying. I wondered many times who in the name of heaven had been telling them about me. They grill me. I am so thankful that God gave me enough common sense not to get mad at the best people I had in this world. That when they told me what God wanted me to know, I didn't go out huffy and puffy and mad and arrogant and, and say, I just, they, they, they just shouldn't be preaching that, bless God. They shouldn't be meddling in my business. I'm glad. I wasn't all that I should have been, and I've never been all that I should have been. But I'm glad that when they preached the Word of God to me, that the Spirit of God tore me up. And on numerous occasions, I plowed into the altar. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. 
You're right. And I thank God for the man of God that loved me enough to tell me and to teach me how to live. I don't say it because I'm your pastor, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm the best friend you've got in this world. I'm trying to help you get ready to meet God in eternity, and we're an eternity-bound people. And when the Word of God goes out, the Bible says we're to receive it with meekness, and that means we're to receive it with a teachable spirit. And when the Spirit of God speaks to us, we ought to be willing to say, Yes, Lord, it's me. So God can help us receive it with meekness. I go to my doctor occasionally. I went to him, went to him just recently. And you know, you always think the worst about certain things. That's where, that's what my son does. We came home one day and Jeff was laying on the sofa about passed out. What in the world's wrong? I mean, he was sweating profusely. He got a met. We had some, we bought these medical books, and he opened up one of these medical books. He found a mole on his body somewhere, and he he's reading about moles. And every all the bad news that medical book gave him, describing that mole, pinpointed him to the bull's eye iota. And he read that medical book. He just knew he was gone. He was dead. He had cancer. Scared him to death. We come in and the, I'm not. Ask my wife. Ask him. The pages was wet. Where he was sweating from being frightened profusely. The sweat was running off of him. I said, what in the world is wrong with you? And I got this mole and I just read here and I probably got cancer. I, hey, I went to the doctor the other day. I thought I had a spot. Probably it was cancer. He examined it and he said, no, I don't think it is. Man, you know what I said when he said that? I said, well, praise the Lord. My doctor's a Christian. I said, well, praise the Lord. That's, that's good news. He said, yes, it is. The people in ours are going to have to put up women a little longer. Now, if I'd had cancer, and he said, you don't have it, and let me die without trying to help me and treat me, he wouldn't be my friend. Somebody that has the opportunity to be honest with you where there's authority and they refuse to not be honest with you, they are not your friend. I want you to listen to me. I was on a play. I had a funeral. I had a funeral Thursday night. Burroughs Funeral Home over near Walnut Cove, North Carolina, 7 o'clock Thursday night. Man met me out in the lobby of the funeral home and he said, Do you ever, wa-? he said he watched us on the, uh, the Bree and Hour. He said, Do you ever listen to, and he named a pastor that bought a football stadium or a big ball stadium recently. He said, uh, you ever listen to Mr. Olstein? I said, not if I don't have to. He said, well, can you tell me? What do you think about it? I don't think much about it. I heard him say in an interview, he never mentioned sin. He never mentioned anything negative. He, it was his job to keep people positive, keep people pumped up. Wait a minute. That doctor could tell me I've got cancer, but it's going to be okay. And lie to me. And make me feel good, and I'll die sooner than I would have died. I'm going to tell you something. A preacher that will stand up and make you feel good in your sin. I don't care how handsome he is. I don't care how many people he's preaching to. He's not your friend. And when a preacher says with his own mouth, I never preach against sin, you can bet it down. You can write it down, mister. You can write it down, Mrs. Miss and the boy and girl. You can write it down. God didn't send him. God sent, sends the man of God that will expose that which is wrong and try to help that and complement that which is right in a person's life. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, Reprove and rebuke and exhort. 
we got all these ministries today that are hitting on the positive. And you know as well as I know, when you go out tonight and get in your car, you won't go home if you don't have nothing but a positive post on your battery. It takes the positive and the negative to get you cranked. And it takes the positive and the negative of this Bible to get you living right. And, and hey, hey, if the, doctor, if the doctor examines me, I want him to tell me the truth. How many of you are in agreement with that? I want the doctor to tell me the truth. You go to the doctor this week, you want him to tell you the truth. You get in legal trouble and you go to the attorney. How many of you want the attorney to tell you the truth? Yeah, the rest of you are lying. You go to an attorney, you want him to be honest with you. If you think you're about to be sued, you want him to tell you what your chances are. And the chances are he's going to tell you they're good. But isn't it amazing? A lot of people go to church and they want the preacher to lie to them. Hey, preacher, make me feel good. All right, I will. You're a low-down sinner and you need to get it to Jesus and get rid of it so you can taste that the Lord is good. Get your sins removed so you can go to bed and sleep tonight. That's what makes you feel good. People don't stay good. People don't stay feeling good in their sins. Because the thing about sin is you've got to have more of it to keep the feeling where it ought to be. Next thing you know, you're overcome by it. It is righteousness that God, that God blesses. Why? Because God's righteous. And we need to learn how to be righteous. And more like Jesus. And we are to receive the Word of God, the Bible says, in meekness. You know what the preacher is? The preacher is the doctor of the human soul. And he writes a prescription from the Word to help you. That's what this is about. That's what it's about. I want to ask you a question. I'm getting personal now. Are you man enough? Are you woman enough to receive what the preacher brings across to you for your edification? Oh, I'll tell you down through the years. I've had I've had all kinds to go by me. I've been around long enough, don't you get scared? But I've been around long enough, I can pretty well read people. I can read expressions. Now, I'm not omnipotent, I'm, but I can read people. And I've had people to come by me, and I'd say to my wife, I wonder what in the world caused that, caused that person to get up a myth tree. And then before you realize it, it's a revelation. And it happens. And uh, I've had people, <laughs> first church. I had a lady come by me one day. Before she got to me, she put her hands up like that and started towards me. And her husband grabbed her by the arm and held her back. She was going to, she'd come at me, she was going to claw the daylights out of me. And he got her and shoved her by me and got out on the front porch of the church and started down the steps. And she jerked loose from him and did an about face and came back towards me just like that. And he grabbed her again. Now, I would say that I was not number one on her list. And the whole thing was over. I wouldn't allow her husband to be a deacon because he wasn't faithful. Now, isn't it amazing? She didn't receive the Word of God with meekness. When the Word of God goes forth, we need to be teachable. I said we need to be teachable and willing to hear what the Word of God is trying to teach us. Now, I'm heading towards the finish line. Turn back with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I want to help us. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Here's the verse we read this morning. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, notice the word readiness. How did they receive the Word of God when it went out? 
They received it with readiness of mind. That's a very interesting word. They received the Word of God eagerly. They, they had an eagerness about them when they received the Word of God. They said, hey, let us have the Word. And that is a word which is used of something rushing towards something. Now get a hold of that. They received it. Here's what they said. Hey, preacher, preach to me. They moved towards the Word. And they said, man, I'm excited. I like good singing. I thank God for our people here. But I, I, and I get excited in music, and I, I'm thankful for all the people do here. But I want to tell you, there's nothing that excites me like the Bible. And, and the crowd that has to have somebody singing about little Willie's shadows cropping across the grave to get, get their foot patting. Listen, that, that's okay. And, it's, and, and, and I'm going to sing a solo here before long. We're, we're working on it right now. I love to sing. Working on one. It's called The Last Sunday. I'm serious. I haven't got the music for it. I'm working on my backup right now. We're going to call the group Lester Flat and Earl Scrub. Now, I, I'm, I'm just here to tell you. But, but listen, they ran towards the Word of God with an alert mind. It's my job to preach the Word. And it's your job to, to rush towards the Word and say, Hallelujah! Feed me! Give me the Word! I want to earnestly receive it. I want to move towards the Word with excitement. And man, when I say, folks, let's turn to Acts chapter 17, verse 11, we ought to so love the Word that somebody across the auditorium would say, Amen! That's how important the Word of God ought to be to us. That we're excited about the Word of God. I've had the, <laughs> I've had the opportunity last year to preach in a lot of different churches. And I'm amazed at the different temperatures and different environments in different churches and how people respond differently to the preaching of the Word of God. Wednesday night I was preaching and this man came in and he, when he came through the door of the church before the service started, he came through the door of the church and the first thing he said when he stepped inside the auditorium from the side door, he said, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Scared I have a dozen people today. And when he came in, after he said, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, he said, you're looking at a dead man walking. And he'd been sick and almost died. And last Wednesday night was his first time back in church. God touched him and raised him up. Man, he walked through that door. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! You're looking at a dead man walking. Thank God he touched me. Well, good night. He had something to be thankful for. But no more than anybody in this building that's saved by grace. Man, we ought to come in this church and say, bless God, everything else is going wrong. But there's one thing going right that whatever's going wrong can't change. And that is, I'm saved and going to heaven. <clears throat> Take that, devil. I'm on my way to heaven, and nothing in the world can change that. I think I'll just enjoy being saved instead of enjoying being miserable. A lot of people out there enjoy being miserable. But it's amazing at the different attitudes that I find when the Word of God is preached. Man, I preached two or three times in two or three different churches recently when revival almost broke out. I get to talking about why we ought to pray in the name of Jesus. I did that Wednesday night. Man, there's people holding up both hands all over the church. Two services back, I had people standing up holding up hands, praising God. We're talking about why we ought to pray in the name of Jesus. Wednesday night... I was in a big way of preaching. And usually when I go out, I don't preach in the pulpit. I just come down here and preach. I did Wednesday night. I preached the whole service right there. This old guy I was telling you about, he was sitting over on my left. He said, Amen, preacher. Shoot from the hip. I love that. This man is excited about the Word of God. I have him say, Preach on, brother. I can never forget old Brother Jones. Some of you new folks, I wish you could have met Brother Jones. Dear, dear, old white-headed 
a little short fellow, man of God, came to our church many years ago. Man, he loved the Lord. That's going to be crowns more than he'll be able to contain when he stands in the presence of the Lord. Drove a little old Plymouth car, a Dodger Plymouth car, a whole yellow car. Sit down here on the parking lot, straight drive. He'd bring that thing in, back it up. He didn't want to use the starter. If he'd wire the starter out, he'd get in that thing and undo the, uh, take the brake off of it and put it in gear and let it roll off and drop the clutch and crank it. He didn't realize that dropping the clutch was going to tear the clutch out, jerk the car around. If you ever raise the trunk of his car, it's full of newspapers. And the old car would sit like that going down the road. He had it weighted down. But old Brother Jones, I remember him in the other auditorium over there. God bless his memory. Remember old Brother Jones over there? I'd get in the big way of preaching, and Brother Jones would say, Say it again, brother. That's right. Our people back there remember it. Say it again, brother. And old Brother Jones wanted to tell you something. You'd, you'd hear it before you got away from him because he'd hold your hand and wouldn't let you go. He had a unique way. He'd come up and get you by the hand rub your belly all at the same time. Many times he'd come up and talk to me. He'd grab me by the hand. He'd take his other hand. He'd rub my belly. Now, Brother Jones had some unorthodox ways about him. He's different. He was unique. There's been another, there's never been a greater witness in the city of Western Salem. No Brother William Jones. Never has been. He came up to me one day. I've had kidney stones since 1980. I'll never forget. Brother Jones came up to me one day. Dear brother. That's what he'd say. Dear brother. I know I can get rid of those stones. I said, Brother Jones, tell me. He said, you need to drink a couple of beers and jump up and down. I said, I don't think so. But, but everybody's got a little carnality in them. Pastor up here, the Southside Baptist Church, called me. I'll never forget it. Is this the pastor of the Baptist Church? I said, yes, it is, sir. He said, uh, I want you to know that we have a live nativity scene up here every year. That was their extent of outreach evangelism ministry. That's the only thing they've done all year long. Trying to get people in with a live nativity scene with a donkey out in the front yard that wasn't near as big as the one in the pulpit. They had a live nativity scene. And they said, Preacher, are you, here's the very words he used. I can remember it as if it happened five minutes ago. He said, Preacher, I got a question for you. I said, Yes, sir. Are you trying to sabotage our live nativity scene? I said, Sir, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you know, we have this live nativity scene every year at Christmas, and we try to get new members in our church. And there's somebody from your church up here all night last night handing out, he didn't call them tracts, he called them brochures. There was a man from your church up here, everybody came up here to look at this live nativity scene, is handing out brochures about your church. I said, no, sir, I didn't send him. I have no idea. I have no idea. I said, what did that man look like? Well, he said he was a little old short, white-headed fellow. Oh, yeah. I said, I know who you're talking about. He said, would you do something about it? I said, I sure will. Next service, Brother Jones, a little short, white-headed fellow came into the church. I ran up and grabbed him by the hand. I said, way to go, brother. Way to go. I'll, uh, the preacher asked me to do something about it. I'm going to do something. I want to congratulate you. People ought to get out of a dead funeral home and get somewhere where there's somebody that's got the emphasis on the Bible, the Word of God. Amen. Anybody that's a liberal church ought to get out of it. I'd recommend they get out of it. A man told me years ago, the second church I pastored, I, I was in the process of trying to win him to the Lord. And he was visiting our church, and I said, why don't you get saved? And why don't you come down here and get saved and join this church? He said, preacher, I can't leave my membership. He said, and he called the name of a Methodist church about four or five miles from where I was pastoring. I said, why? He said, well, all my family is buried out behind that Methodist church. And he said, my family wouldn't like it if I moved my membership. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, we don't have but just a handful of people, and we've got to keep going there to keep enough money to keep that cemetery moved. What an incentive to go to church. I said, let me tell you something, dear friend. I said, if your friends knew the condition that church is in, 
They would want you to dig them up and take them out of that cemetery and take them somewhere else and bury them where there's something going on that's alive. God help us. man said to me recently while I was preaching, Let it roll, preacher! Let me tell you something. When you become eager to receive the Word of God with meekness and become teachable, God's getting ready to use you. When you start receiving the Word of God the way you ought to receive the Word of God, I want you to listen to me and I'm finished. Something great's getting ready to take place in your life. You know why? I want you to get a hold of the verse of Scripture. We're going to have an invitation. Turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I never noticed this until recently. But notice what the Bible says in second, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I want you to see this. For this cause also think we God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Now, I want you to watch this last phrase, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Look at the word worketh. It's in the present tense. When you receive the word of God, not as the word of men, but you receive it as the word of God, the word of God works. It works. It works in your life. It is a seed that germinates in your life. And it works, it works in you that believe. You say, preacher, sometimes I read the Bible and I don't get anything about it, get anything out of it. You just remember, you're putting a living book in your mind. And when you think you're not getting anything out of it, God's putting it in the depository. And at the right time, he's going to give you a recall. And that blessed old brother's going to pop out. And when you're going through a difficult day and you've got problems and pressures in your life, the Holy Spirit's going to recall that for you. You're going to say, well, hallelujah. I remember reading that. It didn't really make any difference in my life. And all of a sudden, now it's become a strength and a consolation to me. But that can't happen if you don't put it in there. And we've got to receive it with meekness and readily run towards it and not be offended by it. But whatever God wants to do in our life through His Word, we need to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to receive with meekness the engrafted Word. I'm going to allow the Word to be engrafted into my life. That whatever you want to teach me and whatever you're trying to show me, I'm going to be a good student, and I'm going to receive it from you with praise and thanksgiving. Folks, God wants to take you to the next level, but He can't take you there if the book's not important to you. Our heads are bowed. Lord, I want to thank you again for your word. How important it is, how precious it is. Dear Jesus, don't let us take something that's so important, be so easily offended by it. And don't allow us, dear Lord, to take that which you've given to us and not be ready to receive it. Help us to have a readiness to have an input to receive your precious word. And help us to have a desire to know more about your word, that we may grow. We may get to the next level. We may become all that you would choose for us to become. Bless these dear people that you've honored me to pastor. And I realize we're not going to always be together. Lord, while we're here, while we've got a few years, a few days, a few months, Help us through your word to love each other. May the tie only increase as pastor and people work together to get to the next level of the word of God. That we may become what you would have us to become. 
Help us tonight to allow the Word of God to be in our life all that you would have it to be. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Just a moment, we're going to stand. If the Word of God is not what it needs to be and where it needs to be, and if you're not allowed it to do what it ought to do, as we stand, would you just make your way on down here? Just acknowledge to the Lord, Lord, I haven't loved your Word the way I ought to. But I want to change some things in my life that your Word may become a priority. I hope you will. Let's stand together. Just keep coming. As the Spirit of God speaks to you, just keep coming. Make time for God's Word. If you need to make your way on down, we're going to sing a stanza. If you need to make your way down, come on down. Make time for the Word of God. Make time for the Lord. He'll make time for you. If the Spirit of God speaking to you, would you make your way on down right now as we sing?